Now let's look at equilibrium and the role of the inner ear in equilibrium or maintaining our balance. The inner ear has the vestibule and semicircular canals that are charged with maintaining the equilibrium and they're in charge of either static or dynamic equilibrium. So we'll look at both of those. The inner ear is not the only structure in our body that helps with equilibrium or balance. The eyes, of course, do. It gives us a perception of where we are in the world and how our head is positioned. Ask anybody to close their eyes and stand on one foot, you'll quickly see them starting to sway side to side because they've lost that eye input about their body position. So then that triggers the next or another portion of our equilibrium system, and that's the proprioceptors we find in our neck and joints and the touch receptors in the sole of our feet. Again, as they're swaying side to side, those proprioceptors send impulses to the brain so the brain knows body position. But of course, our ear helps us quite a bit in this, and that's again what we're going to focus on in this lecture. The structures responsible in the inner ear are the vestibule and semicircular canals. The vestibule, you'll remember, is part of the bony labyrinth, and it houses the utricle and saccule or saccula. Inside those two structures is the macula, one of the two equilibrium recept types of equilibrium receptors. Then there's the semicircular canals, again part of the bony labyrinth that has the semicircular ducts contained within it. At the end of those ducts are large swellings called ampulla. You can see those here. The ampulla um, houses the crista ampullaris, which is the other equilibrium receptor. Now if we look at the two receptors, they're going to look very similar in structure, and I hope you see that they look very similar to the structure, the organ of cordy that was in the cochlea of the ear. The crista consists of a cupula, which is a gel-like substance, very similar to the tectorial membrane we saw in, uh, associated with the organ of cordy. Then there's the hair bundles, and hair cells, and then nerve fibers from the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve. And the same principle happens here that we saw with the tectorial membrane and hearing. Basically, this cupula will move one direction or another that causes the hair bundles to bend, and that triggers um, neurotransmitter release from the hair cells, which then causes action potentials to be sent down the nerve fibers and so that our brain can register those action potentials as part of our balance balancing system. The macula has the same basic structure. The otolithic membrane here is like the cupula or the tectorial membrane. Again, we have some hair bundles. They do have specific names, although I'm not going to have you worry about those names. Those hair bundles are attached to hair cells and the hair cells then are synapse with nerve fibers. The other thing we have to look at is that we've got these otoliths or otoconia. The otoliths are little crystals or think of little sand particles that sit on top otolithic membrane and so that when you bend your head and those the gravity pulls those otoliths in one direction that helps pull the otolithic membrane over to that side therefore we bend those hair bundles that triggers the hair cells to release neurotransmitter and then again we're sending action potentials in response to the release of neurotransmitter down those nerve fibers for your brain to interpret that for part of an equilibrium system. Now let's first look at the macula in more detail. The macula is in charge of static equilibrium. Now what I mean by static equilibrium is basically changes in velocity of the head movement only. So a linear movement, like when you're riding your bike, um, that movement in one direction, in one line that you'd have while riding your bike or driving your car, that would be another one, in a straight line, or just simply the position of your head in space. The hair cells, remember, are going to release neurotransmitter in response to the movement of the hair bundles and depending on which direction they move. Changes in the level of the neurotransmitter release then cause a change in the number of action potentials that are going to go down those nerve fibers here. So in this drawing we can see here's a man's head, here's the 
an otolith in here to represent the otolithic, the otolith and the otolithic membrane, so that when he tips his head to one side, that bends the hair cells in that direction. That causes the release of more neurotransmitter, causing a lot of depolarization in these um, nerve fibers or vestibular fibers, and so an increase in action potentials along those fibers, and your brain reads that increase in action potentials and knows the position you're ahead based on that. Tip your head in the other direction, then the otoliths bend in that direction, dragging that otolithic membrane with it, bending the hairs in the other direction. Now, no, less neurotransmitter is going to be released from the hair cells, which means a decrease in action potentials down the vestibular fibers, and then our brain will interpret that as the position of the head in a different direction. The crista ampullaris is in charge of dynamic equilibrium. This is the type of rotational movement. So we can think of this as when we start spinning. Um, in this case, the cupula, when we start spinning, um, will get pushed to one direction because of the endolith moving in opposite direction of the spin. This is due to inertia. So for, a thing of, for example, when you start um, moving your car, when you put your foot on the gas, the car goes forward, but initially you kind of go back. And then that would be the similar kind of inertia relationship that we see. That means then, because it's the, um, the hair cells are being bent in one direction, that will cause depolarization, and your body or your brain interprets that as the start of a spin. As you continue to spin, the endolith comes to a rest. And that simply just is when you, when after you've put your foot on the gas and initially you go back, you eventually kind of, in a sense, catch up and you're moving and you stop being thrusted back. You're moving with the car. Um, and so that would mean no depolarization event because the endolith is, isn't moving anymore. And your brain interprets that, that you're in the middle of a spin. Then you stop spinning. When you stop spinning, the endolith moves in the same direction as the spin, just like when you stop your car, you're, you go forward a little bit. And so that would move, in this sense, move the endolith in the same direction. That bends the hair cells the opposite direction, causing hyperpolarization. And then your brain will read a decrease in action potentials from that as the um, end of the spin. Now every spin will cause two ampulla to respond. So in interpreting the two responses from the two ampulla um, as far as depolarization or hyperpolarizations events, then your brain will know where your head is and that you're in some kind of a dynamic equilibrium event. Now when you have confusion of signals or a mismatch of signals in your equilibrium system, then that can lead to motion sickness. But it also depends on how sensitive you are to that mismatch. So for example, imagine if you're on a cruise ship and you've unfortunately run into some rough seas, there's a storm or something outside, so you're staying inside your cabin. Well, the boat is swaying side to side. So your inner ear interprets that as saying, hey, you're in motion but your eyes look around the room and the room's perfectly still. So your eyes are saying, no, we're not moving anywhere, we're, we're sitting. So that's a mismatch or a confusion of signals that can make you feel nauseous. The, the best thing to do would be to go outside and so that when you look out on the, at the sea, you see the boat moving or you see the swaying of the boat or the movement of the sea and the horizon, that then your vision will agree with what's going on in your inner ear and you won't feel as sick. Again, this depends on how sensitive you are to this mismatch. Some people can handle quite a bit of this mismatch. Some people can't handle any of it. For example, my husband gets incredibly motion sick. He um, couldn't even watch my kids ride the merry-go-round when they were little. I'd put them in the merry-go-round, they'd be on those horses, and he'd try to watch from the side, and he'd see the merry-go-round in a circle, and the horses going up and down, so visually there was motion, but inside his inner ear, there's no motion. That disagreement would actually make him feel sick. So 
To prevent motion sickness, you need to take Dramamine or Bonine. Both of these are anticholinergics. If you think about it, remember back to our autonomic nervous system, what that means. Think cholinergic, which of the autonomic nervous system divisions does that tie to? Parasympathetic or sympathetic? Hopefully you're thinking parasympathetic, so think anticholinergic is antiparasympathetic. So Dramamine has this effect by shutting down some aspects of the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay? If you remember, parasympathetic nervous system is in charge of rest and digest. So it revs up your stomach, revs up your, your digestive tract. So Dramamine does the opposite of that. It quiets down your digestive tract so you're not as likely to throw up. Dramamine is also an antiemetic, that is, it works directly on your stomach to um, prevent nauseousness. So that's going to end our video lecture on equilibrium and therefore the series of lectures pertaining to the special senses.